Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm so excited to have Beck Warm on the show today. I had such a fun time recording with her. She's got such a fun and bubbly personality and she's got a zest and adventure for life. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I got to learn some new stuff about her farming. And so that's always exciting for me because I, I do love to uh, learn something new all the time. I really think you guys will enjoy this. Um, I think that she's got a lot to offer um, the world and, you know, and to share and, um, She's someone who is not afraid to step out of her comfort zone and to explore. And uh, and I loved it. And I hope that you guys really enjoy this podcast with her. Um, I did want to share. I know that uh, I, I did mention it prior, but I do have a podcast guest playlist. And Beck contributed some songs to that. So the link for that guest playlist is in um, the links wherever you're listening to this. I have a link tree and I have a link to the podcast guest playlist. And I love that because you get to get a feel for all of the guests and their musical taste and and what what they like. So um, you guys can check that out. I hope that you enjoy that. Also, um, Beck has her own store uh, um, out West Country, I believe it is. It's in the links in the show notes. And she sells um, some beautiful items like uh, this ring right here. And um, so we're doing a giveaway for she has a beautiful Aztec uh, blanket. And so that is up for grabs for a giveaway. So if you're interested in that, please go see the link on the um, podcast links and you will, um, you'll see where you can go ahead and apply for that. And uh, I'm excited about that. Um, we'll do the, uh, I'll put out all the giveaway information on the post and I hope that you guys really enjoy this. So without further ado. Hello and welcome to the Power Within podcast. I'm your host, Lori. And today I'm so excited to have Beck Worm on the show. Beck, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Very exciting. <laughs> I'm really excited to talk to you because I, I really love the content that you share with farming and travel and all and growing food and, you know, with your kids. So I, I'm really excited to have this conversation. So I want to start with... Um, I know that you are from Western Australia and you grew up there and you talked about um, on your YouTube, you have a uh, Back Out West is your YouTube and you talked about yeah. like, um, and in your blog, you talked about how you, you were like a beach girl and you really enjoyed that. But then um, later, I think it was later teens or early twenties, you started um, getting into roping and farming. So what was it that made you make that switch into exploring that area of your life? Yeah, you've done some good research. Um, so I grew up near the beach. Um, we lived three, two streets from the beach. You could see it from our house, which was an amazing upbringing. Every day after school, we'd go down and go bodyboarding, which I don't know if that's an all over the world thing, but it's like surfing. <laughs> um, and I did that all the way up, all through high school. Um, even at high school, we went surfing and stuff. But it wasn't until... I guess my later teen years, like when I was 19, that I was like, I feel like something's missing. Like, I don't really want to live this life anymore. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left school. I took a gap year after um, I finished year 12 and then did interior design at TAFE, which is like, I guess, college. Um, and I did six months and I was catching the train every day to the city and I hated it. I was just like, this is not me. Um, I don't like being in the city or anything like that but I still didn't know what I wanted to do and all my friends were becoming teachers and I was like maybe I'll go to uni so I went to uni and university Australians short and everything I always feel like I have to <laughs> say words <laughs> twice um and I did do uni and I was studying to become a elementary or primary school teacher and it took me, I think, six years to complete the course because I kept deferring years because I wanted to go work up on a big station, which is like, a, we call them stations here in Australia, um, a big ranch up north, the very top of Australia. They're um, a couple million acres, a million acres roughly. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, master cattle and ride on horseback. And I guess that all stemmed back to when I was a kid, we would go to family friends' farms and camp there and shoot and go on the quad bikes. And 
Um, we'd go fishing and forward driving with the family. So I just really wanted to get back to that, but make it sort of a career. And um, well, I, my parents were sort of like, you've already done one year of uni, keep going. And then I'll defer a bit. And anyway, I did finish my teaching degree and I did become a teacher for a year and a half, but I made sure that I got a job remote. So I took a job that was um, about 13 or 12 hours from home. Um, and I was 110 k's east of Esperance at the bottom of Western Australia. And I absolutely loved it. There were 60 kids in the class and I had grade one twos. And then I eventually met my partner and, oh, and at the time in there, when I was at uni, <laughs> I decided I wanted to start horse riding. So I was about 22 and I'd never ridden a horse and I wanted to start rodeoing and I just bought a horse and um, it was a bit of a silly situation. I would never recommend it, but I bought a green broodmare paint, the prettiest horse you could buy. And I was a green rider and yeah, it wasn't the best, but I was pretty confident. And so I learned to ride and I took my horse and my two dogs and remo uh, moved 12 hours to the teaching job and loved the teaching lifestyle, but hated being in the classroom. Like I loved the kids and the rewards with that, but I wanted to go and work on a farm. That was what I always wanted to do. So I, um, yeah, quit my teaching job and gave them notice and went and worked with my partner that I'd met on 70,000 hectares and started seeding. So that's where it all started, sort of started from. And throughout uni, I was also working in shearing sheds and on my weekends, going to family friends farms and learning all the gross parts of farming as well as the exciting parts. So yeah, it never deterred me though, <laughs> the gross parts. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that how, when you bought your horse, is that how you got into um, the uh, barrel and roping with the horses or was that a separate, did you, did you learn that separate from your horse? Yeah. So um, I always, I always liked the idea of having a horse. When I was a kid, I did ask for a pony, but they're expensive and we didn't grow up in a horse family. So it, it is quite hard to get into when you don't have a family that's into horses. Um yeah, so the whole idea was to get into barrel racing and roping and then learn some of those skills as well as take my horse up north to muster, which is now I know not really a thing because up north the conditions are so hot and dry and down here it is very hot and dry, but some of the horses just don't cope with it. You usually borrow one of the station horses, but that was the plan for 20-year-old Beck um, to do that. So I bought a broodmare. Um, I don't know if you know what a broodmare is, but a horse that's had babies and she's not really interested in riding anymore. My one wasn't anyway. Um, and she had a ton of back issues and stuff and um, finding a saddle to fit her was quite hard. And yeah, she would buck me off pretty bad. And like in hindsight, I look back and she was probably in pain and I, I did look into that, but now I would look into it more. Um, she bucked me off pretty bad. I snapped my wrist. Um, I was holding on to the horn um, when she was bucking and that's what actually snapped it. Um, but it never deterred me from riding. I think when you're younger, like in your 20s, you, you're a bit more resilient. Now as a mum of two, I want, when I get back into riding, I want a bomb-proof, cruisy night in this horse. Um, and, yeah, so the whole idea was to get into rodeo and where I adjusted, that's another Aussie term, sort of like stabling my horse, where I stabled my horse. Um, around the corner from there, there actually was a rodeo cowgirl night every, I think it was Friday night, can't remember the day. And we used to go down there and practice with a bunch of girls and then, um, yeah, compete in little mini rodeos. But I didn't do that too long until I moved down south um, with my teaching job. And then I met a bunch of cool guys down there and girls and started team roping. And that's what I really was interested in more than the barrels. Um, I liked that I was teaching my horse to, yeah, rope. She'd never done it before. So the patience in the box and setting her up right. And yeah, the teamwork with your partner. So I, I would be the header and I'd have someone as a healer, but I was never professional or anything. It was all just for fun and yeah, nothing major, just, just a lot of fun on little weekend rodeos. 
Now, a lot of people who work with animals tend to, um, they're able to reflect and say, oh, I, I learned a lot from observing this animal and, and working with this animal. Is there anything while you were doing that and teaching the, the horse all the different things that it needed to learn? Was there anything that you learned from working with animals at a younger age like that? Yeah, so this is probably going to get a bit of doom and glooms. <laughs> but so right when I moved down to Esperance to teach or conding up actually, um, my mum passed away very suddenly. And so I was getting into the, the team roping with my horse at that time. And so I was very anxious not to ride, but just anxious. I started getting quite a lot of anxiety and um, I don't know what, I wasn't really practicing my natural horsemanship and being calm and really listening. And I look back at that and I can see why my horse was very anxious herself. And I, I guess, I don't know what the word is, but she just wanted to go, 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 go. And I really believe horses mirror the rider. And I look back now and yeah, definitely can see that. Um, but no, horses are amazing and, and dogs. I've got Maggie, my Kelpie pup down here now chewing on a bone. But um, yeah, no, I, body language is huge with, that's what you said, wasn't it? Body language. Yeah. Just body language or anything that you learn from observing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, that I feel like they, they mirror you a lot. So same, same with the dog. I don't know. I'm just an anxious person. So I always seem to have the crazy animals. <laughs> and my partner, Connor, he, so when I met my partner, he knew that he wasn't really going to get a lot of time with me unless he got a horse. So he had never ridden and he's actually from Ireland. He's from Northern Ireland um, in Bali Castle. And yeah, he, he bought himself a horse and oh my God, this horse was so gentle and calm. And I look back now and realize that that was because of the time I was going through, she was just mirroring me and my partner is very quiet and calm and gentle and that horse was mirroring him. So yeah, I've definitely noticed that with animals. Now, prior to, I know you've mentioned your husband. Now he, um, you had said he was from Ireland. So was he there for school? Was he, was he there for like ranching stuff or was that something that he got into as you, you guys were spending time together? No. So Connor was, I think, oh, I can't even remember how old he was. Early, early twenties, probably when was it? 2009, he came to Australia I'm from Ireland and he was meant to just come for one or two years as a working holiday visa and it turned into him wanting to apply for permanent residency before he met me. Um, he wanted to come to work on farms. He knew a few other Irish guys that had come over and he landed a good job down where I met him and, um, yeah, he, he just loves Australia so much and he's travelled around, backpacked around with a few um or English girls, some German guys all around Australia before he met me. And yeah, he fell in love with it and wanted to stay forever. So <laughs> Now, I know that you guys did uh, do farming and I know that there's a lot of travel that you did. Um, so I want to talk about um, when you were doing farming prior to um, leaving, because I know you took a big, you made a big life decision and decided to uproot uh, later on with your, your family to Canada. But prior to that, um, did you, did you guys know that once you were together that you were like, okay, we definitely want to do farming stuff? Or how did that come about for you guys to get into all the, the farming? Yeah. So <laughs> when I first met Connor, um, I was actually going through a bit of a really terrible breakup. And so all the mums at the school of the school I was teaching would try and introduce me to all their farm hands <laughs> because it was like fresh meat. There's a new woman in town. Like there's no one in the local town. It was so tiny, the community. So everyone was introducing me to these guys. I'm not trying to say like trying to big note myself. It's just what <laughs> happened. And I don't even think the guys were knowing that this was going to happen. And one of them was Connor and I had a talk with him and every guy would just be like, do you ride horses? And they're like, no. And I was not interested in finding any sort of relationship. I was just into healing myself and yeah, didn't want to really go down that route. So um, I met Connor and then we didn't start properly talking or dating until six months later. Um, 
And so he always knew from the very get-go that I was a horsey girl and that I wanted to live on the land and eventually own my own farm and that teaching wasn't really my major passion. Um, I do enjoy it, but, yeah, I'd rather be outdoors and farming and working with livestock. So he knew that from the beginning. Um, Yeah, so Connor and I um, both always really wanted a farm, Um, but in Ireland the scale of farming is a lot smaller. Um, You don't have thousands of acres or even hundreds of acres. Some people have only got 20 acres. So um, he really liked the farming here in Australia and, yeah, we just both, our goals both seem to align and, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> now I know that with um farming stuff too because I know you've talked about like growing your own food and stuff now where you are is extremely hot um yes. during your summer and I know that you talk about the like the red sand and stuff how hard is it to grow like vegetables and food like do you do you guys have to special prep for that type of stuff I know you have for like your chickens you have like special like you put the little tarps up so that's yeah feed and put water down and but what about like growing food yeah so we live um roughly two hours inland from the coast in western Australia in the wheat belt and the other day it was 48 degrees celsius Um, the day after that was 49.5 degrees Celsius. So it's not like that consistently all of summer. It usually ranges between 36 to nearly 50, (laughs) which is insane, especially coming from Canada recently. Um, So therefore the soil and everything, yeah, you need to do certain things. I am not, I don't know a lot about gardening. I'm still learning. But since we've been back, I've been trying to get the veggie garden growing and we've got raised garden beds. And I did do my research with which veggies grow best in summer with the tomatoes and the cucumbers and kind of remember right now on the spot. But they died as soon as that heat um, came through. And we do have, if you go on my Instagram, you'll see some pictures. There's like a little highlight thing there of our garden. But my dad before we moved back from Canada, which I know we haven't gotten into that yet, but he had already set up the vegetable garden in a way that it was protected quite well from the sun. But when you've got that harsh heat shining down, it just sucks all the nutrients out of the soil. Um, And we're on a lot of red dirt and it's clay. Um, So when you're watering the garden, it doesn't drain very well or, yeah, it's just very hard. So all my veggie garden is completely dead except the tomatoes at the moment. Um, The Chickens are going well. We've got, um, we made a whole new chicken coop when we got back from Canada um, and we've made it fox proof because we have a huge fox problem here. So we've had to use a tractor to dig up the clay, run the um, chicken wire underneath, then put the soil back on top or the clay on top and then wrap it around so foxes can't get in. And then we've put a sprinkler system in there for them for the heat. So I turn the sprinklers on a couple of times a day in summer because well, they'll just die. Like it's so, it's so hot. Yeah. I, I see all your, I, I remember you guys had like winds or something recently and I think Connor's corn made it though. Yes. <laughs> and I chuckled with that. I was like, oh, wait, at least the corn I forgot made about it. That. Yes. He's got corn growing. So he doesn't do any of the veggie gardens, but the one thing that he's growing is actually taking off and he put some cling wrap or glad wrap. I don't know if that's what you guys call it there, but the stuff you put over your food to protect it. He put that up on one side to protect the massive amount of winds we had. Um, they're like his little baby, the corn, but um, yeah, no, that's growing well. And so when you guys, I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack a little bit here. Um, So you guys had your, um, you have two young kids. Um, You guys were very established and then you decided that you wanted to make a huge change um, and go over to Canada. So um, what made you, was there, is it just that excitement of trying something new or was it just you guys wanted to experience something what made you especially having young kids and your dogs and having to sell everything and and move everything what made you want to take such a big uh leap of faith into something new? yeah um so when I first met Connor we were dating for like it was that awkward stage of where you haven't asked each other if you're actually going out yet it's you know (laughs) the very first week or two 
And I rang my mum and I was like, I want to um, work on a ranch in Canada or America in the US. Um, I'd, I'd seen like Camp America and I'd seen a bunch of that stuff. We can work with kids and I had my teaching degree and I was like, I really want to do it, but I've just met Connor and he's, she, my mum had just met him too. And she said, don't you go because Connor's a great guy. And I was like, I know, I know, but it's awkward because I, at that beginning stage, you don't want to say, hey, do you want to come with me? Because you sound a bit too full on. So I never brought it up. And it, our relationship sort of went quite fast. Um, my lease was up with my property that I was renting with my horse and two dogs. And Connor didn't pay rent on the farm because in Australia, a lot of the time you get a free house with as part of a salary deal. So he did the sneaky little, um, do you want to come move with me, in with me because it's free rent? <laughs> and then our relationship just really fast-tracked because we moved in pretty quick. We're best mates and um, mum passed away. So within a year and a half, I was pregnant with my daughter, our daughter, and um, it wasn't until she was born I brought up to Connor. Do you know, I really wish I'd gone and done the whole Canada thing obviously I didn't regret the life's decisions we'd made but I wish we'd gone and done that and he's like why didn't you tell me I would have done it too and I was like because <laughs> it's a bit weird to bring it up at the beginning so he was very 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 interested in going too but at the same time Australia was his version of Canada for me he'd gone and done this massive big trip away from home um he you know had this great adventure and I had never really done that I traveled Australia and I've been to Bali and Thailand and a few places but um yeah so he was never fully 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 on board about Canada it wasn't until we moved and bought our own property we bought 40 acres in the same area we're in now in the wheat belt and we were setting up a horse adjustment or stabling um and we put all these pine poles and pine posts and um, we built a 60 metre by 40 metre like rodeo sort of size arena for the horses and we were going to start adjusting horses for people there. Um, and we realised we were trying to build what a typical ranch, I guess, like on Heartland looks like, but the scenery didn't suit and it just didn't feel right. It was 40 something <laughs> degrees. The flies are insane. The amount of bull ants on the ground. You can't just stand and have a conversation because it's bull ants. this was on this property, not every property, but it was insane and it was so hot. And we just decided that, you know what, life's short. Um, we'd had a second child by then, our son Riley, um, and let's go. So we sold the house sort of, or the farm at a pretty crappy time. It was right when the very start of COVID started. So... If we'd held on to it for a little longer, we probably would have made a lot more money, but we just wanted to go and we sold the house, the farm, and we moved to a rental. That was never the plan, but um, we moved to a rental because COVID hit and they shut all the airports down. And so we had to stay at a rental close by on a farm um, for six months. And in that time, we applied for our visas and all of that. <laughs> So when you went to Canada, you had, um, before you get into um, talking about all of the, um, where you were staying and what you were doing, that was a really challenging period of time for you as well, because you had, when you came over, I know uh, you'll share a little bit more about that. You had challenges even just getting into Canada. Yeah and also being stuck in quarantine. And so can you ex explain a little bit of that? Because I know a lot of people, if they hit those type of roadblocks, they may have been like, forget this, let's just go back. You yes. know? What made you want to, even with all those roadblocks, continue that journey? I guess the, the whole dream of Canada and eventually owning a ranch there, um, and we're not millionaires, by the way, I'm, I'm talking about a remote ranch, <laughs> um, is... The drive for it was so much because I thought, well, mum's passed away and it was very sudden. There was no explanation. She had a heart attack and that was it. She wasn't here anymore. She never got to meet her grandkids or anything like that. So for me, life's short. And I think if you've got a dream, go for it. I mean, obviously money gets in the way sometimes and you've got to plan it, but don't just dream, plan it and go for it. So um, it was hard and there was many times both Connor and I said to each other do you think maybe it's some sort of a sign you know we've got visa issues which I'll get into um, we've got COVID 
you know, it's just a lot of roadblocks in the way, the timing of it all. Do you think we're even meant to be going? But I thought, stuff it, let's just go. What's the worst that can happen? We can get there and then we come back. You know, we've always got family and friends back at home and worst case, we're in the same, you know, I, I didn't want to go, not go and die wondering what if. Like I wanted to <laughs> make sure that I had tried. So that was our driving force. And what were some of the challenges that you did experience? Yeah, so. On your journey. Yeah, when we sold the farm, we had, because of COVID, all the airports shut. So that week that we signed the paperwork and handed the keys over, we were in the middle of applying for um, the visas and we were just going to rent somewhere for a, a very short time. But it turned into like six, seven months because of everything that happened. Then um, my partner... Oh, then they, then they made it that you can only enter Canada. This was at the very beginning stages of COVID where we didn't know what was to be and there was no vaccinations and there was no quarantine yet. Um, and then they made it, it had to be a, um, what's the word? Oh, my gosh, I've forgotten, <laughs> I've forgotten the word. It had to be an essential job. Um, so it, uh, farming and ranching it was labelled an essential job because obviously everyone needs their food on their table. So we saw a cattle ranch in Canada. It's the largest cattle ranch in Canada, was applying for farm work. So Connor applied for that and got it, which was great. And they helped us with his visa and he got that granted very quickly. Um, but then when I went to apply for my spousal visa, they asked for a police check. And I was like, yep, that's totally fine. I'll go get that. So waited a couple of weeks for that to come in the mail and then I opened it and it said I had a criminal record that I had absolutely <laughs> no idea about. So backtrack a bit beforehand, a couple of years before, we when we were living on the farm, um, sorry, my dad bought a farm in 2015, the one we're on now, and then we bought our own, the 40 acres that we just recently sold to move to Canada. And when we were moving from my dad's farm to the one we bought, I had my gun license because a lot of farmers do, you need it. Um, and in Australia, it's very strict gun laws that you must keep your gun in your safe and the keys hidden in separate locations. So you've got at the top of the safe, you've got your ammunition locked in with another key in a separate spot. And then your keys are all hidden in separate spots and allowed to be together. So I was doing that for years. And then when we moved to the farm that we bought, the 40 acres, I brought the gun safe with me because I thought it would be better than leaving it in an empty house on my dad's farm because he's got two houses and we're in a cottage here. Um, but I didn't bolt it to the wall the correct way when we got to our new house and the police came to do a random inspection and I got a $900 fine because it wasn't bolted to the wall. The gun was locked inside properly and the ammunition was locked in a separate compartment and the keys were hidden in separate spots but it wasn't bolted correctly. So I got a $900 fine and I paid that. I was never arrested or anything like that. But I didn't realise I was supposed to go to court if I wanted to fight it. I never got that letter in the mail and it went on, on my record. So now I have a criminal record and I'm trying to get to Canada and they refused every visa I applied for. And now we've sold our farm. And yes, some people would say we're very silly for not applying for the visa beforehand. But we we planned and research literally everything I just didn't think I had a criminal record at all um and yeah that that causes a huge amount of issue we um ended up having to hire an immigration lawyer she told us to get an affidavit we flew to Sydney um because that was a layover and I got someone in Sydney to fly uh, to um sign an affidavit stating that I thought I was doing the right thing and that I've changed the way I am which is very silly because it wasn't like I had robbed someone or done something really terrible. It's very hard to prove that you've changed when it was simply bolting something to a wall. So um, the advice of the immigration lawyer was you can apply for rehabilitation, which basically is for people that have drunk drove um, or done something like that to show that you've changed. Uh, but she said it's over an 18-month waiting thing for the application. could be over two years nearly. And we were not 
wanting to do that. She said the other option is if you fly to the US and then enter Canada from the US either by land or foot, I mean, sorry, flying or by foot, um, they can assess you at the border. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I said, what about if I don't get it? And they said, oh, they just send you home. And I was like, oh, my God. So we sold all our furniture, took our seven suitcases, flew to Sydney, got the affidavit sorted there, um, then flew to L.A., then flew to Seattle, stayed the night, and then entered Canada from Seattle um, into Vancouver and waited two hours for the decision. And they ticked it all off and they sort of laughed at it and said it was a ridic ridiculous charge and I was granted two years. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was very stressful. And so <clears throat> when you got into... I. <laughs> I know you also had to quarantine and that was really tough with the two kids. Um, and then, you know, there was some issues with your dogs. Like you, you guys had to travel far and your husband had to go back. Um, I know that there was a lot of issues with that. And then you guys were in Vancouver for a while, but then you ended up in Alberta. So can you talk about what made you go from, was it, was it, was the, intent always to be in like the Vancouver area for I know your your husband had gotten the job or was it always to go over to um, Alberta? So originally before COVID it was always Alberta because we'd been there in 2019 for a holiday we went there um, when it was December January to see the cold make sure we could hack it especially with having horses and stuff fell in love with Alberta and we were like this is where we want to be but then when COVID things came through and we had to have an essential job and the ranch came up in BC. We were like, absolutely, we will go there. Um, we were never set in stone of where we had to be, just as long as we got to Canada, basically. Um, but yes, we moved, we got there, we had two weeks quarantine with two very jet lagged children um, in a hotel room, which was hell. <laughs> um, and it was pretty hard because you just want to go out and see the mountains and everything. And we had a tiny little balcony. You could just stick your head out the, the side of the balcony and just see the mountains. And it was just this little taste. Um, and we did get to get let out for two days. No, one day we went for a walk, I think. Um, but yes, so once we got out of there, we had 10 days in an Airbnb where we had to buy all of our furniture and hire a trailer and buy a car and get our driver's license and bank accounts and all with two little kids under five. Um, and once we'd done that, we had planned the last day of the Airbnb in um, Vancouver was to pick up our two dogs that we were bringing over from Australia, um, Harley and Wolf. One was a Kelpie and one a Border Collie. And we'd set it up with the company in Australia for that, but they had told us the wrong dates. Even though I clarified it a hundred times, they told us the day before and not the day after. So we had to get to the ranch, and which was about a five hour drive. It was out towards Merritt and Kamloops area um, in, in BC. And um, we drove all the way there on the Coca, I can't, I can't, no, is it Coca-Hala Highway? Is that how you say it? I can't remember now. Um, apparently it's one of the most dangerous highways in Canada and it was snowing and we're used to driving on the left-hand side of the road in Australia and now we're on the right-hand side of the road and never driven in snow other than Connor and Ireland with little bits of snow. Um, and there's avalanche tunnels and all sorts of just different cultural differences or differences we're not used to at all in Australia. We got to the ranch and that was fantastic but then, yeah, my partner had to drive back the next day to all the way back to Vancouver to pick up the dogs again and then drive back to the ranch. So that was a bit of a pain, um, but the ranch was the best thing ever. It was especially for tourists coming to Canada. We got to see things that a lot of people that have lived in the city their whole life in Canada have never seen. We would see bears every day in spring and summer. We would have black bears walking around everywhere, not grizzlies, just blacks. Um, we would have uh, moose. Uh, we got to hear coyotes every night. I'd never heard a coyote before. Um, every, every day, seeing proper cowboys like on Yellowstone, um, walking past and nodding their hat at you. And <laughs> it was really cool. Loads and loads of horses. And um, my partner's more of a cropping man. He He's not a livestock man. He, he prefers the tractor side of farming. So he was working with that. And I was being stay-at-home mum with my YouTube channel and 
yeah, Instagram and stuff. But yeah, so it was, it was a really, really cool experience. But unfortunately, the pay in Canada, and yes, sometimes life does come down to pay. You can't always be about life experiences. Um, we were chipping into our savings in a lot with the pay of agriculture in Canada. Um, it makes you realise in Australia just how well we do get paid. And a lot of people had told us that before we left and we did research it, but yeah, it, it just meant we had to leave. So um, after seven months on the ranch, we kind of applied for a different visa and we said our goodbyes and sadly left the ranch and drove across BC over to Calgary in Alberta. And he started his precision farming job there, which is what he used to do in, in Australia and does now is a precision farming specialist. So installing GPSs and calibrating tractors and things like that. So he was back doing that work, whereas on the ranch, he was a farm hand slash manager. So um, we moved there for that and scored a, an amazing, amazing property. We got, I always say that life's not, you're not lucky in life. You work your ass off and you get it. It really annoys me when people say, oh, you're so lucky you've got that. And I'm like, no, I really worked. But the property we secured for the rental was pure luck because there was no rentals available and I refused to live in the city. I just really needed my space. I like to be able to have a bonfire and even if I don't have horses or anything, I just need some space. And we secured 20 acres with Rocky Mountain views and it was like half of the property was Rocky Mountain views and the other half was an amazing neighbours that um, had he was from a ranch and um, they in Montana and they had horses and so they would put their horses on our property and we'd have barbecues and drinks together and it was just a really amazing time we absolutely loved Canada and Alberta and BC and yeah <laughs> Now, I know you were just saying that, you know, you didn't want to live in the city because you just need to have that kind of nature. Yes. And I know that um, you have shared some stuff where you you talk about, you know, needing to ground yourself and be immersed in nature. Yes. So what does that feel like for you when you know, okay, I need to get out in nature? What is that feeling inside of you? And also, when you do get immerse yourself in nature and you do ground yourself, what is that feeling like for you yeah. when you get back in balance? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, here comes my hippie thoughts. Um, <laughs> I guess being a mom, I I don't know, I am so over, <clears throat> sorry, my voice. I am so overstimulated all the time. Um, just, it's just constant mom, 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 mom. And the dogs want something, the chickens want something, the, <laughs> the cat wants something. It's just full on. I usually say to my partner, that's it. I need to go outside. You need to look up. I mean, he he's joint parenting with me, but he needs to take them for a while. And I have to go outside. I have to water the garden. I usually end up soaking my feet in water. And I know that sounds very odd. Remember we're in Australia. So we're wearing flip-flops or thongs, we call them. Um, <laughs> outside so it's not weird to soak your feet but um I've always been like that when I was younger I'd run to the beach and just jump in the water sometimes in my clothes and I know that's so weird but it makes me feel an immediate calmness and that grounding feeling where you just feel at one with nature I know it sounds very hippie but um I've always been like that even when I was at uni and I was trying to stick it out to do my teaching and really didn't enjoy it every day I'd drive 45 minutes up to my horse and I wouldn't even ride I'd just sit there in the paddock with her and lay on the grass and just listen to her doing her horse noises and chewing and yeah picking the grass and yeah I've just always been like that even as a kid and it's funny I see my daughter exactly the same Matilda she's very much a clone of me with that very observant of oh the birds sound nice or look at the sunset mum or she's both kids are but she's very much like me with that and it's I think I also get it from my mum but yeah I just it's just that sense of grounding and calmness and it's not really a want it's sort of a need it's very strange it it is and when you were talking about the water I know that there's like proven things like that where people you know take off your your shoes and even like showers and yes stuff. And they talk about how that water will balance people out. So yeah, I love that as well. And for me, uh, hiking is something like whenever I feel like I'm overwhelmed or stressed, 
I'll go, I love going to the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Yeah. And I will, if I need to clear my head, that's what I do. And when you get out in nature and you can smell the trees and you can just feel the earth beneath your feet, there's something really special about it where it just... Um, I love touching trees. Sometimes I'll just yeah. like kind of hug a tree. Um, I guess I'll have my hippie. Skin. No, I'm the same. Yeah, I'll hug that tree. <laughs> like I can just kind of feel myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really important. So how big of a, how big of a role does nature play in your life? Yeah. So I'm, I'm an early riser. I'm usually up at like five thirty, six o'clock. Um, part of that is so I can have some time to myself because obviously mum life's quite quite hard sometimes to get quiet so I do get up straight away and I walk outside with no shoes on um, and sit on the step and just get that first lot of sunlight I think it's really important I also have thyroid issues so I lack a lot of vitamin d even though I'm in the sun all the time it just doesn't convert for me um so yeah I I do it that way and I'm obvious I, I always go outside I check the chicken eggs like 40 times a day just to get outside and it's quite funny when you said about the tree. We in Australia, we have native trees, obviously, and they can endure really hard, harsh summers. Like they don't need even water. Like they're pretty good. But there's one tree out there, <laughs> it sounds so strange, that I water every day just because I feel sorry for it. it. It looks fine. It's completely healthy. But that's my little grounding tree and it's right near the veggie garden and yeah, I think if people don't get it, they probably think you're a bit strange, but the people that get it, get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so when you were when you were in Canada, obviously you were immersed, especially in Alberta, in that beautiful nature. Um, how important was it for you to have your children kind of get involved in that too? Because I know farming's important to you guys and also that nature element. So how important was it for you to share that experience with your kids? And what did you hope for, for them to learn and get from that experience as well? Yeah, so when we're on the ranch, it was a bit hard to let those strings go with the kids because I'd always been, in Australia, we have really bad venomous snakes. I think they're the top venomous snakes in the world. And I couldn't just let the kids run outside. Like, it is really bad. Even with the redback spiders, you'd leave their bicycles outside and under the seats every day I'd be checking that there's no redback spiders that have recently crawled under there because they bite, you got to go to hospital. So when we got to Canada, it was very strange to be able to just go, okay, kids, run outside. I know you guys have bears and you got moose and you got <laughs> all that, but you can see those. I know that that doesn't sound normal to yeah, I don't know. My dad thinks I'm crazy. He's like, why would you prefer Canada over Australia with the wildlife? Because there's bears and stuff. But I don't know, snakes are sneaky and they are so fast and you got to get to the hospital and we live somewhat remote and it's just always been a real fear of mine. So it was fantastic going to Canada and being able to just let the kids play in the backyard and not have to worry about that. And they had bare feet. There's no prickles. <laughs> it's grass. Like we don't have any grass out here. Um, there was a scary time though with the kids that, um, sort of made me think maybe I shouldn't let them, let them go off. Oh, it was just my daughter. I didn't let my, at the time my daughter was five and my son was two. So he stayed with me most of the time, but she went off to go feed the neighbor's goat with their little girl and a farmhand, um, cowboy guy was in his ute. Um, sorry, not you pickup truck. We call them utes here in Australia. Um, and yeah, he came running over and he had the kids in the car and he's like, just letting you know, there was a bull, um, a bull calf, um, moose looking at your kids. And I just picked them up and I was like, oh my God, like the one time I let her go off and do something. But that was the only time that something bad happened in Canada where I was like, oh my gosh. Whereas here in Australia, the kids have to put on their, um, boots no matter what, when they go outside and they have to go together and they are not allowed to run to the chicken coop. They have to walk and they have to look in the chicken coop first before they go in because I'm scared that there's going to be a big snake in there or, yeah, it's, it's very stressful living in Australia. I felt like our life in Canada with the outdoors, and I'm not saying it's easy in Canada. You obviously have your challenges with, um, with the winter and stuff like that, but that sort of side of things, the stress of being a parent with little kids is so much easier. It was just a relief. 
So it was really important for me to have the kids experience that as well as snow for the first time. And yeah, they loved it. And I know that you had, um, what I found really interesting is when, um, you, you have a video where you talk about, uh, why you were moving back and you kind of give the differences between the two, the two, Australia and Canada. And you had talked about how, you know, in, uh, Canada, it's nearly impossible to live on just one person working. And yes. I totally feel that even in the U S because that cost of living is out of control now. Um, how hard was it for you, even with the financial aspect of it, how hard was it for you to um, make that decision to uproot your family again and move back? Because that's that's now two huge moves within that two and a half year time frame. Yes. Was that hard on you because I, the kids had gotten settled? I know your daughter was in school um, and you kind of had gotten accustomed to that lifestyle. So was that really hard for you to have to make that decision? I know your husband had wanted to go back. But was it something mutual or was it um, more like, no, we have to? Yeah, so um, the kids were fine. They've always, they've, we've always lived this sort of gypsy soul life. So they're used to having friends as seasons and not lifetimes for a while. But we always said that once they get to, you know, halfway through elementary or primary school, um, we want to be a little bit more grounded because that's when it's a bit harder to uproot for the kids' sake. Um, so they were completely fine with it. They were quite excited to come back to Australia. But the reason why we came back was I noticed Connor, and he wasn't depressed, but he was. It wasn't his. his ugh, wasn't his. His. He wasn't him himself. Can't get my words out. Um, he was traveling an hour and a half to work every day, um, one way, and then so three hour trip. And then when he would get there, he would have to leave his personal car there and then jump in the work car and travel as far as from Calgary to Montana border, like the border, it's still in, in Canada, um, across towards Saskatchewan and then back across to BC border. And then he'd be back home at like 12 at night. And that was happening all through summer. And he would be on a salary. And I know in Canada, that's normal. But in Australia, you would be getting claps on the back. You would be getting, well done, you've done a good job. Um, you would get perks. You'd get a company car to take home. You'd get your fuel paid for. Um, these are not the reasons why we moved back to Australia. They're just some of the things that led up to it. Um, he was not enjoying the agricultural side in Canada as much as Australia. Um, he likes the cropping side in Australia a lot more. And he didn't dare say any of this to me because he knew that Canada was more my dream than his. And I could just tell, he, he didn't want to ruin it for me. So he just sucked it up. But I could tell something wasn't right. And he'd make little comments here and there. And I, I would put it in my memory bank. So one day I rang my dad and he has a farm, which we're on now, and he's got a spare cottage in it. And I knew that rent, finding a rental in Australia, with since COVID, it's everywhere worldwide, very hard to find. So I said to my dad, if, don't get excited, dad, but if, if we come home, do you think we could maybe move into the cottage? I'm just sussing this out. I have not brought it up to Connor. And dad's like, of course, I'd love you home. You know, it'd be so exciting. He was already excited. He's already planning everything. So I went into the lounge room and said to Connor, you know what, I'm I'm thinking that maybe we should move back to Australia. I wasn't thinking this. I was just, just said it to see his reaction. And I knew instantly that's what he wanted to do. He had a big smile on his face. And he's like, why, why? This has always been your dream. But I could tell that's what he wanted to do. And I felt like we were not going to achieve the ranch that we had originally wanted to get in Canada because of all, everything that happened with COVID, the inflation, um, just just everything that we did plan it all, but it just, everything changed in our plan that we just saw it was going to take longer and longer. Whereas if we moved back to Australia and settled in, in, in the cottage we're in now um, on my dad's farm, that we could farm here. Dad doesn't have any stock on his farm. Um, he said we could, he, he's not interested. He works away and stuff. So we're going to be farming here and then leasing additional land. So we could get that a lot quicker, but in Canada, it would take a lot longer. And we wouldn't have had this opportunity we have now on the farm before we left Canada because it, didn't align that way. It's sort of like we had to go to Canada for this opportunity to, to happen. So 
that was a little exciting for my side and that was an incentive for me to move back. But if we didn't have the farm to come back to or, or the family, then I would have 100% been like, can we just stay in Canada? I don't really want to go back. Um, we both love the scenery. We love, love the people, but it was purely the work life we found for us in our industries, in what we do, that in Canada you work, you live to work, whereas here you work to live in Australia a little more or if you are overly working you get a lot of incentives and people seemed to this isn't every Canadian this is just his job role that he noticed but he seemed we seem to notice that a lot over there um you, you get a lot more perks here which is what you need when you're in this 20s 30s and you've got a small family and you're trying to set yourself up you need to be able to have as much incentives as possible and money coming in to be able to do that and to achieve your goals so depending on your goal, obviously, but our goal is to own a farm. So that's why we, we left um, Canada as well as Australia was Connor's, I, I did say this earlier, but it's like his version of Canada for me. Like he loves it. It's his, he sees it as home more than Ireland, which I know sounds sad and I hope his parents aren't listening to that because he, he loves his family, but he absolutely loves um, Australia. He's very passionate. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's why we came back. And we have said if we ever won the lotto and Connor didn't have to work in the agricultural industry over there and we could just go straight over to Canada and buy a huge big ranch or move to Montana and buy a huge big ranch, we would. But we've got to work and it and works better here in Australia. So that's why we came back, sadly. It's very interesting to see that, like... Um... I know even like in the US, uh, I have other friends who live in uh, Australia and stuff too. And we'll talk about this because I, it's very interesting to hear, you know, the difference in wages and the difference in what's included and what's yes. not. Um, and I, and I love that you and your husband or you and you and your partner, sorry, that you guys make sacrifices for each other. Uh, but you still manage to live your your dream yes. um, in, in incorporating those new things. And I know that you do travel as well. So um, I know that you had shared a beautiful um, in Ireland. You guys went to Ireland and you were sharing like different spots yes. along a roadway that was incredible. So how important is also um, traveling to different places and letting your kids experience that with you guys as well? I know he grew up there. But for you, had prior to um, being with Connor, had you ever gone to Ireland or is that something you only experienced once you guys were together? No, so I'd never been to Ireland before. My sister had, or well, not Ireland, so she's done a whole Europe trip, but not Ireland. Um, because I was at uni, I didn't really get to travel much. Um, I did do a lap a halfway around Australia. I went to Thailand. I've been to Bali 17 times because mum and dad used to import furniture there so I've done a lot of that sort of travel but nothing nothing else um yeah and since I've met Connor we've been there twice when um my daughter was one and then when my son was one um it is quite hard because his parents don't get to yeah they miss out on a lot with the kids so we've been there twice they've been here twice and yeah we we think traveling is really important for the kids to see little cultural differences I mean when we were in Canada um Tilly had a choice to either go to the school on the reserve in um, near the ranch or the main school, and she went to the reserve. We, we chose that, and it was absolutely amazing. She released owls into the wild. She was learning about, like, hunting and fishing and stuff in the, within the school. She didn't actually go out. Um, learned the Okanagan language, um, j just loads of amazing things. Still did her English and, and her um, maths and usual mainstream school stuff, but... It was just really good for her to see the cultural differences and as well as all the wildlife in different countries and just the way everyone does everything. So, yeah, we think it's really important and we do plan on doing another trip. We're saving at the moment because we <laughs> just got back and we're starting our farm, but we would like to go to New Zealand. That's the next place we want to go to. Um, and eventually I'd love to go see Sweden. But that's a little bit... But we're actually not, Connor and I aren't married. We have been engaged since we were, um, how old? Tilly was two and she's eight. So six years, seven years roughly. Um, but we just keep putting our wedding money to moving to Canada or traveling or 
or buying farm stuff or <laughs> sheep gates or sheep or we um yeah it's a lot of money to get married and we're not really really bothered because we feel like the kids are a bit more of a commitment than a ring so yeah I was just gonna say it's just a piece of paper yeah yeah we're not religious um, I'd see so I love that yeah And so uh, I loved when you just talked about uh, when your daughter went to the reserve school. Now, back now that you're on the farm, um, I know that your kids are in school as well. But is it important for you? Do you inc- do you have the kids come out and help you with chores and tasks on the farm, too, that you guys are working on for them to have those life skills as well? Yes, absolutely. So my son, um, his job, I mean, I go out with him, but he is five and he is the egg collector so he goes out it's quite funny sometimes he doesn't want to collect the eggs because it means he has to wash his hands after (laughs) so I have to go with him and then he tells me there's eggs and I pick them out um we also just had two three potty lambs one that we're feeding with a bottle a potty lambs is an orphan or bottle fed lamb um because my dad had his friends had some sheep here and the mum rejected the lambs so we built a little yard up for them. So the kids have been learning how to mix the formula. I usually do that for them because you've got a certain rate with the water and the formula for the lambs. And they've been doing that. So my daughter was feeding the lamb at 6.30 in the morning. And then um, after school, about 3.30 p.m., she would feed the lamb again. And Connor and I would do the nighttime and the middle of the day one. So they definitely get a lot of tasks around. And yeah, it's just normal for them to, oh, my son feeds the dog like biscuits and my my daughter feeds her kitten and yeah they've just always grown up doing that and it's just normal and they don't see it as a chore it's just part of helping out and part of their responsibility of owning an animal they they do want a horse um and I want to get horses again because we sold the horses when we moved to Canada and we've decided to not get any until we've got the sheep up and running again um so Tilly's going to be starting horse riding lessons again. But because of her upbringing, she knows how much responsibility there is involved in that. And I think that's really important with kids to to know that because I think not all kids, but some kids get given stuff way too easily in life. And, yeah, it's good. And it's good, healthy, clean stuff. It's I mean, my kids go on the iPad from time to time, but they're outside doing stuff a lot of the time too. So it's a good, healthy balance. And I, and I know that you um, were talking about uh, the sheep and I think you had said something, if I remember it correctly, that um, you guys were wanting to do white sheep. And I know that there's different type of sheep. Yeah. So um, wh- am I correct with the, the white sheep and why that, like, is that, is it just because of the, the wool from the sheep that, that it's, it's more usable or what, what is that? So in Australia, I'm pretty certain the top sheep that people farm with is usually um, merinos. That's because of the wool, um, but wool prices are down a lot. Everything's down a lot. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice. Everything is down a lot and everything costs a lot. It's just insane. So, I mean, down a lot as in what you earn or whatever. Um, so farmers aren't getting much money for their wool or meat at the moment, which is crap, but it's also a good time to buy sheep for us because we're starting up again. Um, we're not getting into wool sheep we're getting into Aussie white sheep Australian white sheep Um, and the difference with those is they have got a mixture of Texel, Dorpa, um, I'm forgetting the others but a mixture of other sheep that um, make them ideal for us one of the things is they put on weight real easily Um, so when it comes to selling them at lambing time they're going to be at a prime, a prime weight so we can sell them for more money. The other thing is um, they self-shed. So their wolf falls off and then regrows. It's actually the hairless sheep. So um, that's a huge thing for us because out here in the wheat belt, I'm making Australia sound very glam, um, We get she- the sheep get fly blown. So I probably, I'm about to share another YouTube video of us um, docking the lamb's tails, those three little orphan lambs we had. Um, And people will probably say it's really cruel that we're removing removing the tails, but the reason is flies land on there and create, or maggots then end up eating your sheep alive, to put it shortly. Um, And it's disgusting and it's because the tails are there and 
yeah, it, I won't go into it, but it's pretty gross. You can look up fly blown sheep. And so we have to put rings or you can chop, but we don't. We put rings on the tails and, um, yeah, remove the tails for the health and the the goodness. <laughs> I don't know what the wording is. For the sheep. So having um, sheep with no wool is a huge advantage for that because it means we're not going to have sheep in pain or, yeah, lose sheep. Another um, advantage of Aussie white sheep is they're a good temperament sheep as well as they throw a lot of twins and sometimes tri triplets, lambs. So you're getting more bang for your buck. So that, that's why we're going it. But a, a lot of farmers stick with the Merino because they've got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So when it all adds up with the wool, whereas we're just starting out with we're probably getting 80 head of sheep to start out um, and then build up. So who knows, in the future we may go Merino, but for now Aussie Whites is where it's at. <laughs> so do you want to, like for your farm now, like what what are your like long-term plans for that? Like is it, I know you, I know you want to have your sheep and I know you have your chickens and I know you just mentioned that you want to get um, horses. Do you want it to be like a, um, like a uh, I guess like a functioning farm or is it more for your family? Yeah, so um, the plan is to farm on my dad's farm that we're on now. That's 100 acres, which is, it sounds big, but it's not huge in farming terms. Um, run 80 head of sheep here with their lambs. And then once we get into the second year, I start looking at leasing some additional land um, in, the, in the local area. There's no houses on it. It's literally just the land to put your sheep on um, with a trough with water and I'll go out there and check them daily. That will be my job as a stay-at-home mum, but also to run the farm. Um, and then once we lease enough land to use that money to purchase our own property, um, but the goals changed a little. It used to be for me, I want to own thousands of acres, but since living in Canada, to, to own thousands of acres here in Australia for our price range, we have to go quite remote. I'm talking like two, three hours from the shops. And I don't really want to live like that anymore. I'm happy to go an hour from the shops, but I don't want to go that remote anymore. Um, and I'm getting sick of the heat. So the southwest of WA and down along that coast is very expensive, but I'm happy to go for something about two to 300 acres instead and farm on a smaller, it's not small, but smaller level and go a little bit more um, into the stud side of things with sheep where you're not running as many sheep, but you're getting more for for you eat sheep if that makes sense it's not really run as a commercial farm I definitely want to get back into horse riding and eventually training horses that's the 10-year goal and I definitely want the kids getting more into horse riding uh, Tilly's starting lessons soon again so we're not committing to the horse horsey buying horses because they cost an absolute fortune every time we would save money Connor would come home from work and I'd be on the driveway with one or two horses in my hands, like halted up. He'd be like, oh, oh what's happened now? And, you know, the vet bill. So um, saving money with that, she's going to start doing horse riding lessons and then, yeah, eventually running our own, own place. But for now, we've done our adventure in Canada and now it's time for us to hustle a little. And um, the next five years we see us hopefully looking at purchasing our own property. And you also have, um, you have a website too, out West Country, where you, um, you sell beautiful, I love the uh, blankets. That yeah. you have, and you have some really pretty jewelry on there as well. So um, how, because I know that you have so much on your plate, and you also have that, and then you have your social media that you do, where you share about your farming. And um, I think it's a really wonderful. Do you ever like, how do you manage your time to be able to do everything that you that you are doing? So Connor jokes and says, you know, Monica from Friends. The TV show Friends. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm her like I have 40 lists. I have post-it notes that go off from that. Then it's all filed. No, that's pretty exaggerated. But I am a list maker. So is Connor. So I plan everything. It's ridiculous. Um, and I can't even remember the question now. <laughs> How, how, what was it? How do you manage your time with everything? 
how do you manage your time with everything that you have going on with your oh, that's store, right. your farming, your, so kids, the online, your, uh, your partner? Sorry, yeah. it's delayed. Um, the online store only started because on um, YouTube, they started this feature of you can thank someone for their video by sending them money. And so I had some really nice people watching my videos and sending me money, which was so, so nice, like really lovely. But I wanted to give back to those people and so I created a website with just a few little merch things. It has, um, well, there's one here, but a coaster with our um, Bison Out West logo on it, leather coasters and earrings and blankets, just Western country sort of stuff, as well as some digital products. So that way, if people wanted to support us, they got something in return. Um, that's not too hard to manage. It's not a majorly big shop or anything. I love, I do love your Instagram because I, I'm someone who, uh, like I do like, uh, uh, I'm going to call it like small farming. I don't have any like real land, but I, you know, I love to grow food and I love, um, I love kind of seeing other people's ideas and what they do and what works for them. And so I think it's, I think what you share is really, really great. Um, and you, you incorporate some funny stuff too, which I really enjoy. Um, it's a, it's a great, I think that you're a great person to follow to kind of learn about like different little aspects with the chickens and, you know, the growing and, and all that. So I, I do really appreciate what you share. Thank you. Um, what I want to ask you is, is for what would your advice be for someone who wants to get into farming and has no experience doing that? Like what would be, what would be your advice and what would you say is your the biggest challenges you face and what has been most rewarding for you? Um, I would say just go for it. And I know that's easier said than done, but for me, I couldn't just go for it. I, I had to stick out this uni thing. So I would find time on the weekends to, or after uni or days off to go off and help on farms. And I didn't get paid. I just go to get the experience, um, whether it was in shearing sheds or learning to cut lamb tails, which is horrible. And, um, yeah, learning to bring them in with the ute or the truck or the sheep or um, learning to ride and and make sure you take a bit of advice from everyone. Some people will give you advice and tell you not to do it. I um, remember ringing a guy up about an ad for a job when I was at uni still and he said, you're better off being a teacher, you're a woman and hung up on me. And I was like, okay, so don't take every advice. Um, it is still pretty male dominant, but there's so many women out there getting out and doing it now. And it seems to be a bit more of the normal, especially in Australia. There's a lot of women out there doing it. And um, those that tell you that you can't make it into a career don't know what they're talking about because there's women and men up north working on big stations that have started out learning, knowing nothing, been being a first year farmhand and now working as a manager or a supervisor up there. So um, if it's your passion, just go for it because I can't think of anything worse than sitting in an office, looking out the window, wishing you were doing something else and you're stuck in this job role you didn't want to do. Just go and do it. And if it doesn't work, you can always go back to the, the old job, the first job. And you may appreciate that job more and realize you didn't want to do it. But, um, but yeah, that, that was probably one of my biggest things as a, and I'm not bringing the woman card, the feminine card in, but it is still a very dominant, male dominant job farming. And, um, you know, it, it can be a bit difficult that way to try and show that you know what you're doing or yeah, you, you're a bit more vulnerable sometimes, but that, that I think it's, yeah, I'm not really, not very many struggles for me. I don't think, um, I'm a bit headstrong, so I just push those aside. <laughs> Is there any, um, is there anything going into exploring this more and um, expanding what you're doing now? Is there anything that you're looking forward to learning that you haven't learned yet? Yeah, so um, I would like to look more into the stud side of, um, of sheep and eventually getting into cattle. So I do have some, I didn't add that in before, but I worked at the livestock center where they bring cattle and sheep in for sales every um Monday and Tuesday, I think it is. Um, so I used to work with the cattle side there and um, run them through at 4am and stuff ready for the sale. And I would like to get more 
into that side. I, I would much rather have cattle, but the setup for that, and I know I'm talking a lot about money in this podcast, which life I know is not always about money, but when you're setting up a farm, for us, it's a lot cheaper to start with sheep than it is cattle. Cattle yards are a lot more expensive. They're more dangerous, especially with little little kids running around. And I want the kids to be a bit more hands-on on the farm. So we've bought some, we're, well, we're buying very soon, some very quiet temperament sheep and starting that way. But in the future, we will eventually have cattle and yeah, I'd like to learn more about that side of farming. That's amazing. I love, I love this chat. Thank you so yeah, much. I you. really appreciate you sharing your time with me to go over all of this. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And is there anything? Awesome. And is there anything that you would like to uh, leave off with this or anything else that you would like to share? Yeah. Um, if you guys want to um, message me on Instagram, if you've got any questions, you can go and do that. I don't know whether you put that in the show notes, but it's just my name on Instagram. But yeah, if you've got any questions about the agricultural yeah. world or moving to Canada, or I mean, I don't, I'm not a visa advisor, but I may be able to help you out with any questions or cost of living questions or anything like that. Awesome. And any questions about Australia and all yes. that farming stuff? Because I think <laughs> that that's really, really interesting. So, and I'm so excited to continue watching your journey and see what you guys are doing. So thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for all that you do share so that other people can learn from you as well. I think that's wonderful that you're willing to put that out. There. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.